This tutorial will show how to use Rhino, V-Ray, Photoshop, and Illustrator to generate this particular composite image. This line work was developed using three-dimensional graphics statics through a plugin called Polyframe, developed by the University of Pennsylvania's Polyhedral Structures Lab, based upon work done by the Block Research Group at ETH Zurich. Both these groups are pioneers in the field of three-dimensional graphic statics, and if this is something that interests you, I thoroughly suggest that you go research these groups and look into the various plugins and theses that have been developed. For the purposes of this, uh, we'll be looking at the Dendro plugin, which was developed to provide a 3D printable output from Curve generated in Rhino. This script is in the bottom right hand corner and its basic input is for curves into the mesh generation where you can set the thickness of the mesh and its fidelity followed by a smoothing process which you can set the mathematical algorithm and then also final into a mesh output. This mesh output is uh, demonstrated in the following image. And from here, you can see that it's you know, reasonably thick, as I was looking at something that would be reasonable for one-to-one -one scale. This is it zoomed in. From an aesthetic point of view, I mean, it's not great, but it's not too bad either. But I decided that I wanted something incredibly smooth and regular, which is why we'll now look into the quad mesh subroutine within Rhino, demonstration of which is in the bottom right-hand corner. Now, like with any mesh generation system, you're going to be looking at polygon, polycount, or quad count in this instance. In the quad mesh, I've decided on a very high quad count, as well as a um, high accuracy at 90%, and clamping the hard edges so the um, hard, hard edges retain their same form, and so the level of accuracy is still reasonable. Now, with this particular output, so you can tell it to generate a subdimensional form instead, as well as delete the input. That's personal preference. But in the next uh, image will demonstrate differences between a high polycount version and the low polycount version, as shown. So the bottom right-hand corner shows a slightly lower polycount, about a quarter of the quads. And whether you decide to go high or low poly will be down to both aesthetic requirements as well as your memory budget. Now we're going to deal with the line work transfer from Rhino to Illustrator. Now, in order to accomplish this, you need to remember to scale your line work appropriately. I've been working one to one, so that means scaling it. So the export will be one to 100. In the options dialog box as shown, that actually reads as 100 to 1, so don't get confused there. The other critical thing is that we need to make sure that uh, the viewport boundary is also exported and that you set the um, color palette to CMYK. Of course, that can be adjusted in Illustrator, but you can see the confirmation there. Now, when we import it into Illustrator, it's not going to be perfectly centered. However, it will be suitably scaled as seen. So now what we're going to do is center it onto the artboard. And from there, I'm just going to manually adjust it so that it fits the artboard. The viewport rectangle um, provides an indicative guide and I'll need to use the calculator within Windows to position it perfectly so I can calculate percentage offsets and the like. It's a bit fiddly. You need to eyeball it, but once it's done, it's done. As regards to line weights, I set line weights in Illustrator, and for the purposes of this drawing, I set it to 0 0.2. I prefer using Illustrator to set line weights because I feel that it provides a far better aesthetic um, range than using the traditional line weights as shown in AutoCAD or Rhino, which are based on the traditional hand-drawn line weights of uh, architectural practice. Now, your mileage may vary, of course. The other thing, of course, I set this to see MYK because originally this was going to be a print. However, if you're just doing pure digital work, then you'd set it to RGB. Once this is um, set up in Illustrator, I will move into Rhino to demonstrate the rest of the model setup. These columns were created from a rather janky mesh, so I quadri-meshed them again to provide aesthetic consistency. 
Next, the timber balustrade and deck elements have been quad remeshed from poly surfaces. This is to ensure consistent texture placement within V-Ray, smooth texture placement. The UV elements align because I quad remeshed them all at the same time. This is something I've learned the hard way in previous projects with janky textures. In addition, I also used the same quad remeshing technique on the steel balustrade elements to ensure smooth, consistent texture placement, as you can see by the smooth UV grid alignment in these sections. Concrete deck element revealed here is the culmination of the work shown at the beginning of this particular tutorial. The additional elements being added at this point are the black V-Ray blocks, along with my own blocks derived as part of the design project this tutorial is built from. When it comes to the V-Ray settings, you can see I have multiple different light sources here. Now, for the mesh render, I disabled all bar the dome render to ensure that there were not any loom points or hot spots unnecessarily. And the dome lighting itself provides consistent uh, lighting for the type of model I smudge I can go for. However, for the traditionally textured render, I enabled all of the light sources to allow for the proper effect to be brought forth. When it comes to textures themselves, this mesh texture is actually a V-Ray standard texture. However, due to the limitations of the engine, it only renders on the CPU render as opposed to the GPU render. Whereas a traditional um, texture such as the timber or the concrete or the steel, that can be rendered on either engine. And so when it came to setting up this particular you know, set of renders, I ended up having to do one render on the CPU and one on the GPU. As for the mesh texture, I set it to material overrides just for simplicity's sake when I came to render it. And here, of course, you can see that in this instance, I've got it set to the CUDA with the material override disabled. I don't use RTX because I do not have hardware capable of it. The other critical setting is the light cache. Now, I set the light cache to use brute force as both primary and secondary. This provides the most consistent render in this particular case. And it, I found it also actually reduced the render time as well in the tests. I don't have volumetric in all bokeh effects enabled. I haven't actually played around with bokeh effects at all myself. And volumetric I found to be very hit and miss as to its usefulness. Resolution is very high in this case because they're looking for a full bleed printable image. I set the export to a VR image so I can play around with it in post-production as I would a camera raw, and it provides all the necessary layers in a single file. Now we look into the Photoshop aspect, you can see we've got the textured render along with the alpha layer which is of critical importance for this part, and then also the mesh version as well. Next, we'll need to import the line work from Illustrator, and uh, that's going to require a bit of uh, manual adjustment and eyeballing to line up with the rest of the imagery. You can see I'm using the alpha layer here to help align where the line work um, should be positioned along with it scaling. Um, you should see the arrow keys for fine tuning manual adjustment and just you know, dragging as per usual with the mouse when necessary. Now, next, what I've done is set up a series of circles to use as uh, a memoir. What I do is select them and feather. So if you draw your own, you'd select and still feather. And then with that, setting up a new layer and filling with just black. There we go. And what I then do is uh, merge both one alpha layer and that new layer and then I copy that on as a layer mask. You can alt click on the layer mask to automatically switch to it and here we go that's the first layer mask done. And then repeat for the next ones and again to do this you would adjust as necessary um, the feather amounts, the size of the circles you wanted or whatever particular geometric pattern you wanted to do this in. 
I'm using circles for this for now and various types and setting up various different uh, um, combinations thereof to ensure that the alpha mask is appropriate for what I'm attempting to do. And again, same thing, merge the respective layers, copy and paste onto the mask for the layer in question. And there we go, second layer done. And that's the first and second layers combined and you can see where we're going now. And then final layer, same again, select feather, this time inverting it though, um, because of the uh, um, size of the mask in question, and then fill. And we do not need to merge with the alpha for this one. Um, we just copy this onto its own layer mask and done. Hey presto. And that is the combined composite image.